I started this YouTube page about two months ago exactly. And one thing that people keep telling me is I need to be studying Pete Overzet. Just study Pete Overzet. He does everything right. That is the way to gain a following on YouTube, have success on YouTube. And I, I think that that is good advice. I've told them, yeah, that's of course. I've been studying Pete Overzet. It actually was part of my job at Stochastic was uh, content strategy. So studying what other people are doing. And, and of course, Pete, a great example of how to be successful in this industry was something I was already doing. But I kind of think people are underrating. Like you, you can study the thumbnails, you can study the descriptions, you can study the intro, you can study the music, all of that, all the, the graphics. Study all that, and you can uh, have you know more success than you would other, otherwise have. But you can't just replicate Pete Overzet. I don't think there are many. I don't think there's anyone like Pete Overzet in the industry. He is equal parts funny and sharp and authentic and just a fantastic person to have in the industry. I'm really excited to talk about talk with Pete today on episode three of Playing for Keeps. Pete, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. After, I believe the kids would call that a thorough glazing. Are you, are you familiar with that term, Neil? I am not familiar. I'm I'm 40. I know, I know you're only 36, famously, but I'm 40. I'm not familiar with these, these young, young people terms. I only, I've learned, I, any of my hip uh, terminology I learn on TikTok. And uh, apparently when you uh, overly uh, flatter someone, they call that a glazing. Uh, there's the tag on TikTok right now is uh, Dune glazing because every TikToker out there is saying how incredible Dune is. But uh, no, uh, sincerely, thank you for that uh, glazing. Uh, that was very nice. I assume it's a sexual connotation, glazing. <laughs> You know, Neil, I'm not going to go there this early right. in the pod. We shouldn't, yeah, you're right, shouldn't you're alienate right. the We're the not even drinking on this pod is, is the crazy thing. We're doing this in the middle of the afternoon. Actually, Pete, I don't know what is in uh, what you're drinking right now. I don't know if you if you spiked that. I'm not drinking. I'm just drinking water for this podcast. No, unless you uh, include putting some chia seeds in uh, a fruit smoothie, uh, spiking it. No, I am uh, just trying to uh, sneak in a little lunch here in between a, a busy Monday, but excited to chop it up with you today. Me too. Uh, so Pete, I, I would just told Pete before we started that for whatever reason, my Sure app, uh, the mic gang keeps jumping back and forth. Uh, so I just looked again and it had uh, adjusted after I had adjusted it right before the show, it was really down. So if at any point during the stream, you think uh, our volumes are way off, please do let me know. I, I kind of thought that was the case last week with Adam when I gave it a re-listen on the podcast. I seemed much quieter than him. So let me know if, if our mic volumes seem different. I will uh, continue to try to work on that. Um, Pete, Let's get uh, let's get to it. So the the thing that I usually like to start asking with, and I kind of know the answer to this because I watch all of your streams, watch your uh, best ball and DFS after dark. So you've gotten into this a little bit, but I like to start by letting people get to know you a little bit. Tell us uh, your where are you from, where you live now, favorite sports teams or athletes. That are not always related, but often related. Uh, give me a little bit of your background as a sports fan and, and where you're from. Yeah, I grew up uh, just outside of Denver, Colorado. So I grew up, you know, uh, all of the Denver sports teams, uh, of course, the Nuggets, the Broncos got those first Super Bowls there with Elway in uh, 96, 97. That was a, a very fun time. Uh, the Avalanche also, you know, snuck in there. Uh, the Rockies, I believe their first year was 93. So that was a fun time. I remember in the Rocky Mountain News, they were unveiling the mascot, which ended up being this horrible dinger uh, dinosaur, but they were like slowly cracking the egg. And I remember getting really excited to see how what was going to reveal to be the Rockies mascot as a kid. Uh, I went to school in San Diego, and that even turned me into more of a Broncos fan because I was surrounded by a bunch of annoying Chargers fans. This was also in the heyday of Philip Rivers versus Jay Cutler in that rivalry. Um, then I moved out to Boston because my wife is from here and found fantasy football at the end of college. And right when I got out to Boston is when I really started diving in. And then that kind of just disabused me of all of my traditional fandom. And it has been, you know, a slow descent to feeling nothing when Colorado sports teams win anything. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I mean, I, I still consider myself to be a pretty big Timberwolves fan. And yet if I have like a sweat in DFS, I'll find myself cheering against the Timberwolves. If, it's, if there's real money on the line, like it, it is hard to, uh, to, I don't know, to remain a true sports fan when you do have money on the line here and there. So uh, I, I totally get that. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about your background. So you, you said that you started getting into fantasy sports and that's kind of what disabused you from being a big sports fan. And you say that was around the end of college, which would have been what, 2010, 2011 for you is when you started getting into fantasy sports in general. Um, let, let's take it back to the beginning. Uh, for, first of all, um, you know, tell me about your professional background prior to DFS. Do you have any related hobbies? And I know you're not 
a, a full-time like DFS pro. Like you, you do content. You're also <laughs> bigger in best ball and like you, you do all the different stuff. So so DFS is a little bit um, just a small part of, of what you do in the fantasy sports industry. Yeah. But uh, related hobbies, uh, any background? Yeah, if I were a DFS pro, my accountants uh, might have uh, some strongly worded advice for me to <laughs> find a, a new profession. Uh, did did land the 1099 from DraftKings this year. Actually, yes. have gotten it a few years, but nowhere close to uh, being able to make a living doing it. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. It's like I started playing fantasy sports actually in high school, like fantasy basketball. It was when I found fantasy football was like tail end of college. But I used to love doing fantasy basketball, all of the individual moves. Um, I remember finding Basketball Monster, and they had this sick tool where you could basically optimize for the specific rotisserie categories you were trying to win. I was the only one in my league who found it and I would just pummel people five, four, five, four, like and just ship these leagues. So that was like when I first fell in love with like grinding out edges in, uh, in fantasy sports. Um, but yeah, as far as, uh, you know, outside hobbies, additional stuff, I would say I started doing content and getting into doing more creative stuff. Um, when I moved out to Boston, started taking improv classes, um, had done some like comedy writing type stuff for my high school and college newspapers. So I always kind of had that inkling and then really jumped into the improv comedy scene out in Boston, partly as a way to just like meet people. Cause all I knew was my wife and her friends. And I was like, yeah, I should build out my own, you know, friend group and not be entirely reliant on her. And also because I thought it would be fun to try. And so that's when I ended up, you know, meeting a ton of people. A lot of the people I started first making content with in the fantasy space were guys I met doing, uh, improv with it. And then during that entire time, when I started kind of dabbling with this stuff on the side, I, I had a job at a software company, uh, doing marketing and copywriting. And I was basically there for, it ended up being like six or seven years, maybe even longer. I would have to double check why I was kind of moonlighting as doing uh, a content creator stuff on the side. You say you started doing content with people from comedy. That wasn't fantasy sports content at the time, or was it? It was. Well, what, yeah. anybody that I would know. No, no, no. The the show we started with was defunct, and it was what was so crazy about it is it started out not as a podcast. It started out as a live show. We founded the Fantasy Football Comedy Hour because a couple of these guys that I got to know really well, we vibed together. We all found out we like fantasy football, and you know, one of the things at the theater. Um, I belong to is called Improv Boston, and they really kind of leaned into the experimental stuff. And it's like if you had a show idea, you could pitch it, and as long as you had some kind of reputation at the theater, they would allow you to put that show up at least for a trial run. And so we had the uh, brilliant idea to do a fantasy football. It was like a variety show, so there would be some sketches, some improv, you know, some character work. Like our friend did a, an incredible John Gruden impression. We would have him come. And the problem is, is like. As many people here know, fantasy football, already a niche, much, right. you know, then trying to do fantasy football comedy and having jokes resonate. Um, we did some like broad stuff that hit well. There's this uh, female sketch group at the theater that did this incredible like fantasy football hotline that was a spoof of a sex hotline where guys would call in and ask and these girls would be like, yeah, tell me about your fantasy football team. And it would like, you know, the broad stuff would really hit. And then we would be doing specific inside baseball fantasy football jokes. Those would not hit so much. Um, <laughs> random people who would stumble off the street in Cambridge to come to an improv show, believe it or not, didn't want to hear fantasy football comedy. So then we were like, why don't we take this to the internet, turn it into a podcast, get it out to maybe a wider audience who would actually appreciate it. You know, when I when I made the thumbnail for this, and of course I went back through your videos, a lot of them to, to like find good pictures of you to put in the thumbnail. And uh, initially I, I thought about calling you the niche content king. Um, and then I also thought about, I ended up what man's on a mission, uh, which is oh, kind of a reference good, yeah. of the fact that you are just everywhere. You, you are just, uh, doing content everywhere constantly. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, one of the, one of the pictures that I landed on, I believe was from, uh, improv Boston. I think that was in, in the background, the picture of you as, as man's obviously. So, so the man's did the man's originate in improv Boston. He didn't. Uh, he ended up circling back to that. I think I did. I did stand up as man's at improv Boston. Yes. Yes. It was stand up. Yeah. Um, no, the, the man's origination, I think I've mentioned it a few times. Um, it actually kind of dovetails with our entire sphere. I had started, you know, doing the improv and there was a job opening at DraftKings and they wanted um, an on camera host. I believe in a lot of people know him. Adam Kaufman ended up oh, getting yeah. the job that I went into. Adam's awesome. I did his radio show this past year, which was like a coming full circle moment. And I was not ready for the job. 
at the time. Um, you know, I was like a decent improviser and, and okay on camera, but like just not, I was very green for what they were looking for. So it makes sense that I didn't get it, but I came out of that and I was like, I have all of this live improv experience, but not a ton to show for it. Like essentially no real, no clips online, just all these performances that disappear into the ether the second they're done. And so that motivated me. I was like, I should start doing video content. Like if I want jobs like this, if I want to do this stuff, like I need to do video content on my own. And then I was like, but I don't want to do traditional analysis. You know, I, you know, seen so much of it, so much of what we're doing at the fantasy football comedy hour was spoofing that kind of stuff. And I was like, maybe I could do a character uh, and do kind of DFS spoof type content um, and thought up that Guido character man's, but yeah, man's was essentially born out of not getting that job and being like, I need to start making videos. And maybe there was a part of me too, where it, it's always a little easier to hide behind a character too, where it's like, if you get rejected, maybe it's like, oh, people just don't think that's funny or whatever, but it's not like, it's not you, you know, it's the character doing things, right. but that kind of provided, I think the vehicle and the confidence for me to just start making video content. And if you go like scroll to like my very old YouTube videos, they are primarily man's videos. They're all man's videos. I, I, I yeah. sorted my oldest. That's another way. If you want to go back and watch some of that man's content, to be honest, I was not familiar, not that familiar with man's. Like I have people reference the man's all the time, man's coin. Like I've seen here and there, but it's not a, a part of your content that I've been extremely familiar with until I went back and watched some of them. Uh, one where you you confronted a hater. Let me ask you about that one. You you confronted a hater. Maybe you don't even remember at this one. Was that an actual like hater, like actual person yeah. who had commented? <laughs> that yeah, because one of the beauties. Um, you know, it dried up a few years ago. I've obviously stopped doing man stuff, but even like up until a few years ago, there were people who didn't put two and two together that I was man's right. like for like when I, I eventually like spun everything off and had a, a separate man's Twitter feed. And once I did that, I essentially never promoted man's on my main Twitter feed. A lot of people would say that's very dumb, like growth strategy, like use your one platform to, but I liked it being this separate character. Um, and one of the things that's so fun about doing a character when people don't know, especially early on, is a lot of people don't realize it's a character, or at least the not right. too smart ones realize it. So yeah, there was this one guy, and uh, he was he was doing content creation. He had like some kind yeah. of general sports podcast, and he really didn't like my stuff, but he was engaging with it as if it was real. You know, if you right. if you know it's not real, you just say, "Oh, this is not funny." Like I'll move along. But he was engaging with like the content and the substance of what I was saying, and I was inspired. One of my favorite comedians, Chris Gethard, who's done like a ton of incredible, like I don't know, kind of alt comedy stuff over the years. Had a public access show. Now people know him from his podcast, Beautiful Anonymous. Um, he way back in the day. He had someone who was, I don't know if they wrote a letter to him saying he didn't like some comedy show he did, but he like invited him to do an interview with him. It'd be like, you said this about me. It just confronted him head on. And so I was like, I think this would be a fun thing. I know this guy wants to be a content creator. What if I just invite him to do a con, uh, an interview with me as man's and see what he doesn't like about me? And he agreed. Uh, that's the one thing about content creators is they never will turn down. Right an opportunity to get on camera. And so, yeah, I have not seen that clip in forever, but I remember very much enjoying doing that interview. <laughs> what, what I, my, my favorite part of that interview, well, so, so first of all, he, he was like, I couldn't tell. He kept on being like, what's the deal with this voice? It sounds like you're putting on a fake voice. I can't, yeah. can't tell what's going on. Uh, but then my favorite part of the video is at some point you asked him a question and let him go. And then you put Z's scrolling on the screen <laughs> as he was talking. That really got me. I, I, I love that. People should go back and check out uh, the, the old man's video. If you like like a little bit of comedy intermixed uh, and what you're doing, um, this was the other question when I started talking about uh, calling you the niche content king. Did you ever think it would get even more niche than you, and a porno would be made about your <laughs> best ball breakfast? A take a takeoff on best ball breakfast, uh, of course, best ball brunch. If you're not familiar, um, was was a tribute to to Pete Overs. That I would say, uh, can it get any more niche than a porn about a content a, a fantasy sports show? I mean, that was probably the one moment where I was close to bringing Mans back because <laughs> that would, I mean, Mans would have made an absolute meal out of that moment. Yeah. Um, that would have been like a spoof that I would have like thought up. It's like, oh, Mans tries to become like the first best ball porno actor. And it sounds so absurd. Like clearly it's a spoof. And then no, that's exactly what happened. No, that was that was definitely one of the most, mind blowing moments of content creation. You know, Adam Levitan always says like, we live in a simulation when this crazy stuff happens. I mean, that was a true sim moment 
right there. And it's still wild um, that that happened. And it was, uh, luckily I had my friends on the internet because when I told my wife about that, that I had a porno that was, you know, uh, an homage to some of the content I made, she was not too thrilled to have those conversations with me. So <laughs> I only can have those conversations with my internet friends. Yeah, I, I, uh, I can imagine why your wife would not be a huge fan of that. Um, but pretty funny. It was pretty funny that that happened. Like just like the, the discourse surrounding that on Twitter was, was very good. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think you can get much more niche than doing a porno about uh, an already niche topic. Um, getting back to your background a little bit, and let's talk about your background as a player a little bit. Cause I am curious, like I, I think of you as having sort of a similar play style to myself where like, you're not creating any of your own stuff. You're using publicly available data to put together good teams. But uh, I guess I don't know for sure that that is the case. So uh, do, do you do any of your own like projections? Um, do you use an optimizer? Tell me about your process for DFS a little bit. Yeah. I mean, when I started out some of the first con DFS content I was doing, I was, um, you know, first, uh, you know, I did some stuff for four for four and then Roto Grinders was like, hey, do you want to make, it was when I started doing the Swole cast, and they were also like, hey, do you want to start making some like comedic shorts for our Twitter? That's when I made like the original DFS guys uh, video, you, you know, the stuff that you got, oh, I got out of match with, auto match with Levitan, oh, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, like all that stuff. Those were originally Roto Grinders videos. And then the other thing I was, you know, thinking of content ideas and I was like, what if I did, um, I forget even now what the name of the, it was in the chat or in the at the time, maybe someone in the chat can remember, but I was basically like, I will review my GPP lineups on DraftKings as a novice. You know, I was not claiming to know what I was doing. I was just like, Hey, uh, not a lot of people at the time were reviewing lineups. There was like Levitan reviewing his cash game lineup and you know, YouTube isn't like what it is now where everyone reviews their teams and right. does all that kind of stuff. So I was like, Oh, this will be fun. And I, you could not pay me to go and watch those back, not because I wasn't good on camera, but because my DFS play was so bad. I remember <laughs> later, like hearing from Blender that he used to watch those streams and just like be screaming to himself about me talking through some of my logic. Um, so yeah, like I have gotten um, a lot better as a DFS player. And I feel like that's been kind of what's fun is documenting that progress publicly. And a lot of it, you know, I think where things really accelerated for me when I started doing lulls with Brian when COVID yeah. hit, um, I essentially got to pick Brian's brain behind the scenes about a ton of stuff. And obviously, like even then, he had a sophisticated process that I wasn't able to emulate, but so many concepts I was able to learn from him. And then also, you know, Mike Leone, who I consider a good friend, who when we were making lineups with tilt space and stuff, I would learn so much from him talking through stuff. And so I think specifically through getting to talk with Leone and Brick that really accelerated or at least brought me up to speed. And then from there, I think I just really started to embrace kind of the game theory aspects, sometimes to a detrimental sense, you know, where I'd get too fancy, too galaxy brain. And I would say it's not been until like the last year, year and a half where I've almost like reeled it in mm. in a good way where I've like found a better equilibrium of like everything doesn't have to be a sub 5%, you know, leverage right. play. Um, and understand. And I think, you know, credit to the Sims and those tools that kind of bear that out explicitly in your face. Like, yes, this is what good lineups look like. So yeah, I would consider it kind of just everyone getting to watch me become a better player, whether DFS, best ball, dailies, you know, this year was the first year I kind of documented my dailies and uh, had some success there. So it's it's been fun to see that arc because I was just stone cold, a losing player my first few years playing DFS and it hasn't been until the past, you know, two to three years that I've been consistently profitable. Yeah. I think for most of us, there, there's a, there's a learning curve there. Like th there are people who like, I know nerdy tenor, like stepped in and like, he like ran the Sims ahead of time to like, and back tested his, his stuff and put in low volume. Most of us are kind of learning as we go. So yeah, the, generally the, the learning curve takes some time. Um, so you, uh, so it sounds like you you were basically hand building early on, and more recently you're using uh, the Sims. I, I think I've heard you say you use the solver. Is that correct? Yeah. So basically, what I mean, the solver was obviously you know new for this year. I would say traditionally um, for showdown stuff, I would always be like using an optimizer, and then the past few years I've um, been using run the Sims uh, stuff for showdown. Oh right, right. Um, and then for I've always enjoyed, you know, the, the way I think about it is like main slate i i enjoy just sweating a couple lineups i've never been an mme guy for main slate but on the flip side like showdown i find like single or three max to just be a miserable sweat and i want to have the 20 or 150 so that's why i've gravitated optimizer um sims for showdown but i've always loved for main slate to have one to 
three lineups this year, I really kind of reeled it back in and kind of articulated like, Hey, I think I'm getting sloppy making subpar lineups because I'm just like, Oh, I want this idea here, this idea here. And then we'll just jam in a bunch of stuff around it as opposed to like making my best possible lineup. But I would say I've really enjoyed like a hybrid hand builder versus opto slash Simbro approach where, um, in previous years, I would go about it hand building first and then check it just like simple stuff. Like what's sure. the product ownership? What's the ceiling? Is this within the ballpark of how much I'm willing to sacrifice relative to an optimal? And then this year, the process almost reversed because of using the solver. And, you know, I put some light rules in grade out the lineups. And then I would essentially, by the end of the season, I was just cherry picking the lineups I liked. And that was like, there was an act of humility with it too, because sometimes there'd be like, I don't, I don't want to play Garrett Wilson this week. Like I, I don't, but I'm like, it makes this lineup work. It's ownership percentage is what makes this have higher leverage. And like seeing, like trying to get behind the machinery of the Sims and understand why it's giving yeah. it to you. I then kind of found pleasure in that. So I would say I've always enjoyed like that hybrid approach of, I want to check my work because I don't trust my work on its own. But I also want to have some control, some autonomy and not just like be like the machines can do everything. Yeah. Uh, am I correct that you like historically you've primarily just been I guess, I guess you said you played fantasy basketball early on, but I've never thought of you as being an NBA DFS player. Is that correct? Like, are you primarily just NFL DFS? I know with the dailies now you're getting into other sports, but like, is it is NFL a, a big part of your volume, I guess, is what I'm asking. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would say near exclusive. Like, I'll, okay. you know, I'll do a few drafts with the badge bros uh, yeah. across the different sports. I did have a period where I was trying NBA DFS is probably would have been, I don't know, it would have been like 2016, 2017, a long time ago. Um, wasn't quite as competitive, but I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I, I'm definitely, um, I have like an addictive personality. I'm a, a completionist too. And, you know, I would want to be like consuming all this information and learning it. And I just, I realized I don't have the bandwidth. And then also it just dovetailed so nicely with best ball exploding even like dynasty football where it's like, I didn't necessarily feel the need to branch out and be like, ah, oh, I gotta, you know, do this stuff. Even like trying to do a little bit of USFL, a little XFL, like a few years ago, had fun with that. But then I was just like, man, I don't think I have the time with it. Like everyone's badgering me for, for best ball streams and all of this stuff. And it's like, I don't think I have the the time to go all in on other sports. So yeah, I've been like 98%, you know, NFL over the past few years. I do recall you at one point calling yourself an XFL thought leader. You, you might have worn this same hat, the uh, the XFL hat, which uh, much yeah. cleaner than cleaner than mine probably. Uh, but I recall the the XFL XFL thought leader days. I'm I'm sad. I'm sad that that's gone away. That you're so you're not planning on being a UFL thought leader then. I probably like I would love to bullshit and bring back the thought leader bit, um, but I doubt it. Um, the only time I've had non NFL DFS success, sustained success, was. League of Legends. Uh, I, of I was famously like top 23 on the Roto Grinders <laughs> uh, leaderboards there for a little while uh, in the heyday of, of somewhere COVID. in the top 23. We can't say exactly where you no, were yeah, in the top 23. Could have been anywhere. Could, I mean, might have been top 22 and I just refreshed at the wrong moment. Any, you know, someone would have to fact check that. Could have happened. Um, all right. Uh, and, and you, uh, so, so you, you're not doing your own projections, your own ownership projections, anything like that um you're, you're using what's publicly available yeah yeah there, there was a time where i was like trying to aggregate a bunch of ownership projections i found that um most valuable um just for getting a wider sense of the market and but yeah no i have never originated uh anything like that so i want to talk I, I do want to talk to you about content um and i'm always like Whenever I watch your streams and I hear you talking about content, I'm like, oh, this is super interesting. And then I wonder to myself, like, is this only interesting to me because I also make content? Do, do other people care about But it's always like the most interesting conversations to me that you have on like your, your After Dark series or like when you talk with Feinberg about doing content, you talk with other content creators, like, oh, that's super interesting, like hearing about their experiences doing content. Um, so I, I do want to talk about some content. I have no idea to what extent the audience cares about content versus just hearing about like, process and, and strategy and all that kind of stuff but it's what i it's what i want to talk about and that's what we're doing uh on in, the, in this yeah. conversation i definitely get in my head about that too i mean if this show was traditionally uh you know if we we're doing a live before lock right now and we were talking about oh, meta yeah. content then maybe you'd have an issue i think people know what they're getting into but in general like my thought on it is again yeah know that the show and what your expectations are but people 
ultimately like hearing you talk about things you're passionate about. So if yeah. it's something you think about a lot or you have ideas about, I think, and I get feedback by that too. I, I think I even just got a comment on my show with JJ where or someone was like, yeah. I'm not even in content creation, but I enjoyed, oh, it was the one with Rick Rungood. Um, yeah, yeah. And someone mentioned that they were like, I, I have no you know, aspirations or any inclination to do this, but just hearing you guys talk shop um, is, is interesting. So I kind of lean toward people don't mind it. Yeah, I, I honestly, I've, I've loved that series. And of course, I know it's behind the paywall. So if any of you are wondering what we're talking about, you have to go behind the paywall uh, to a certain level on Pete's YouTube, which of course is at Peter over. I don't think I said this at the beginning of the show. You can find Pete on, on Twitter and on YouTube at Peter Overzet. Uh, is the handle. And if you subscribe at a certain pay level, uh, can, you, can you tell me what the pay level is, you know, off the top of your head? Uh, yeah, if you want, now we're kind of entering best ball season. So there's a second tier below the DFS. I do um, in season, the crams on okay. Sunday mornings, which Nez in the chat referencing that honestly is probably one of the biggest value add things I do crowdsourcing a bunch of sharp D, uh, GPP players right before lock on who they're playing. I'm telling you, if someone found a way to actually quantify that sentiment, you'd get about as close to actual ownership projections as possible. Uh, but yeah, for the the $7.99 a month, that'll get you all of the After Dark shows, which I would say are very kind of similar vibe to, to this podcast. I do them on Saturday nights for live stream and it also unlocks uh, a channel in the Deposit Kingdom Discord. Yeah, I've been loving those. Uh, and of course, I, I watched a few of those just with, or a couple of them, at least within the past week. But I feel like I've watched just about all of them recently. I didn't know. About, so uh, part of the reason I bring it up, I didn't know about it until you had me on for DFS after work. I was like, what do you what is this? Uh, so I at that point, subscribe to the channel to see what it's all about. And now, of course, I watch every single one because uh, I find them to be very entertaining. Um, but I'm, I'm getting off track. I'm forgetting where I was. Uh, Bindles, of course, says he loves some content talk. Of course, Bindles, another content guy also. Um, oh, yeah, I was going to say that the Coach Speak Index one was, was super oh, interesting. Yeah. Hearing from uh, the Greg behind Coach Speak Index, um, who, you know, it's one of those things like when that kind of thing starts, it's like I have no idea how good this person is at what he's doing. Like It was one of those like, yeah. okay, Coach Speak Index, like you're trying to like give numbers to like how often a coach is accurate with what they say or honest about what they're saying, whatever. But it's like, I've never, I don't know who's behind this account. I have no idea. Back testing that. it. <laughs> I feel like after yeah. listening to that episode, I feel a lot better that like, oh yeah, this is a really valuable. And I, I kind of had already picked up on that since I've been tracking it over time. You know, he's been around for a few months at this point. Um, but it was, it was a really interesting conversation. He's definitely very serious about what he does and, and seems like a, a very sharp guy also. So um, yeah, that was oh, for sure. a good, and good I, conversation. I like the, you know, sometimes it's, you know, it's fun. Like, you know, obviously we have a bunch of friends in the industry and you can turn on the mics and just talk about whatever and it comes effortless and it's like people are just eavesdropping on your combo at the bar. But I also have really enjoyed bringing on people that I like know nothing about other than their work and, or not even like even Rick run good. Like it's, I'm not like lying and pretending like I consume all of his content. Like I'm not right. a golf guy, but I appreciate what he does. And so just getting to have those different, you know, change of pace conversations, uh, is kind of fun. It is funny. So I, I was gonna, I was curious, uh, how you think about this. So you never, I never had you on high stakes when I was at stochastic, my old podcast, sort of similar to this one. And I think part of the reason was I'm like, I kind of always figured, well, I could get Pete because like I know he's comfortable in front of a camera. So it was like you you would have obviously been a great guest, but it was always like I'm always trying to get the people that are going to be the hardest to get first was yeah. always kind of my thinking. Uh, people that I'm like, I'm not sure if, if they'll say yes. So like I was always inviting like the DFS pros who are in the shadows who you've never seen before uh, and always inviting those people on first. And then I kind of I, I agree with you. Like it, it's kind of fun to get to know people that you don't know very well. But at the same time, I kind of like the, these conversations too. Where it's like I watch your shows. I don't know how many of your shows I watch, but I watch several Pete Overzet shows every single week. So like, I kind of, I feel like I know you, even though this is, I think the second time we've ever done a show together. Um, so it's, you know, I, I like a mix, I think of like some people that I don't really know all that well. And then also I, I do enjoy having these conversations with people that I know a little bit better, which, you know, I didn't, I don't know uh, Sacrilegious all that well. Yeah. I've seen some of his shows, but like, it was fun having him on kind of getting to pick his brain. But then, you know, of course, last week I had Adam on who I've done several shows with and you know you have i've watched a lot of your content so it is kind of fun to have the mix i think 
No, yeah. I mean, that's kind of been, you know, what we always like doing at Lulz too. Like when you get, you know, I'm even sheepish, I, I mean, about doing pods like this, not because I don't enjoy doing them and I don't want, not that I don't want to go support other channels in the space and stuff, but it's always like, I just feel so overexposed that I'm just like always talking and that there's more interesting voices that people want to hear from. Um, but with the like DFS stuff, there is this ripe community of like how many, like, I'm sure we could probably think of, 15 interesting people we'd like to talk to that we don't even have a face to a name like yeah oh yeah i mean like did you know uh that one of the chipotle brothers has one of the most successful ai newsletters in the space right now yes because it's on my feed constantly it's on your feed constantly. Yeah, yeah like there's all kinds of crazy stuff out there where there are these interesting people within the dfs space partly because they do other interesting things beyond dfs but yes to come all the way back around i think getting to talk to people who aren't you know, overexposed, it is very fun, like getting to hear from, you know, shady advice recently, getting to yeah. hear from sacrilegious who, you know, he started to do a ton more content recently, but hadn't yeah. really before. That's always fun when there's this untapped vein. And I think being able to uh, bring that to people is always enjoyable. Yeah, for sure. It, it is. It's always, a, it's, I think it's good to have a mix. And I think that you've done a good job of having a mix of like, maybe you don't know these people and then also uh, some, some bigger names as well, but it's, it's fun to have that mix. Um, you, you mentioned uh, uh, using, you said this on one of your recent streams, that you kind of use underdog daily drafts as like a steam index to get an idea of like, are people going to be like, are people clamoring to play this player who projects well or not? And uh, kind of do the same thing, but I, I haven't tracked it that closely. Have you found that to be like useful? Like just kind of tracking like, okay, well, nobody's drafting Chuba Hubbard in these underdog dailies so he's probably not going to get ownership just like as a random example have you found that to be kind of useful in predicting ownership in dfs yeah and again i'm not saying in a way that's been quantified but i think in general yeah. just having a separate market with a lot of similar variables is very very helpful and you can i think the reason why it the, the steam index i guess as i would call it it is it's often a reflection of you know, who are sexy players, right? Like there was examples this year when um, Zeke started getting his big workloads for the Patriots at the end of the season. And, you know, ETR, everyone was projecting him for a pretty hearty amount of points. And he would just not budge on underdog. And I do think DraftKings users, because they are more sim and optimizer based, will always come in higher on those guys because sure. they're just going to trust the numbers more so than people who actually have to be like, I'm clicking this guy yeah. I don't want to click. So True. I do think sentiment gets out of control a little bit more on underdog where the sexy young thing is more desirable but i have found it to be you know very directionally accurate in that regard and you know i i remember probably one of the biggest examples i think it was a kenneth walker week against the cardinals this this year and he just like everyone just kept talking about the matchup yep. over and over and next thing you know he was like 104 in the underdog dailies and i'm like this is, I mean, his ownership is just going to be insane on draftings too. And I think he came in like 65% really that high. week, which was really high for like at a medium price salary. Like this wasn't like a stone punt running back. So yeah, I like that. I think it's, it's very much helped me get a gauge because so much of ownership, you know, you think about obviously very algo based beginning of the week sites, make some tweaks on things, but there is a lot of that sentiment that is, unless you're listening to every podcast, I know blender likes to check in on stuff and that helps inform that. But I found like the market movements on underdog to be a proxy for that. I'm like, you don't necessarily have to listen to every single content, but what if you could have a place where people are already stress testing their ideas and their right. sentiments, uh, you know, right before lock. And so, yeah, I, I always found that very helpful. And then it worked both ways. Like one thing we would always do like on off and on the clock with the badge bros. And we're trying to find who are the scroll, the F down plays. It's like, Who's the punt play? Every, oh, everyone's playing Demario Douglas at 3K. He's getting undrafted. Like he projects well for a reason. And I love kind of using those markets to inform each other yeah. and to like get exposure in different places. You might be like, I'm not playing 30% Pop Douglas um, because he's a fringe guy. But if he's going to be sub 5% used by the field on underdog, I'll go get my exposure there. Right. That's that's a, definitely a sharp way to approach it. Yeah, I've tried to do kind of the same thing. Like, But I, I didn't get into the dailies enough to really take advantage of this year but it was definitely something that i was when i did do them i was very aware of like how can i use these you know to get a gauge of each other definitely uh interesting ryan else says neil learning from an influencer master that's true <laughs> influencer master uh this is a wise choice um got a question from jewish mccaffrey that i wanted to ask um 
with you being one of the biggest names in the DFS content space, Pete hates this so much that we keep complimenting him so much. He's just so uncomfortable. How, how do you like, also before answering the question, how do you like being in that chair? Like you are the host of just about everything that you do, being the, the person who's being asked questions. How are you, does it make you uncomfortable in general or is it just because we keep complimenting you? No, it's just a compliment. Like I, my Sirius XM I do with Kendall and she's yeah, the main sure. host and I kind of serve as the, the analyst on that. I have no problem uh, being in that. Yeah. It's just the, uh, I don't know. May, maybe I'm being naive. I guess I don't consider myself as a, a top DFS. Con maybe I'm being naive about that, but I guess I just, or have an inferiority complex about it, but I don't I know. I mean, you've got what, like 16, 17,000 YouTube subscribers. You've got a big Twitter following. I'd, I'd say it's a, a pretty fair assessment. There aren't that many people who have huge uh, YouTube followings in the you know, fantasy sports content. I guess space. I think about it like, yeah, I guess as like a content creator, but if you're talking about like, you know, Leone, you know, can tweet out a mispriced ADP and like change the market, you know, like I, I'm not doing that, you know, certain sites with their projections that I think are actually influencing play, but I'm probably just getting into semantics right now. Yeah, I, a little bit. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. But I, I think that it is a fair assessment that you're one of the biggest names in the DFS content space. Um, and then I guess the first question that JMC asks is, is this the vision that you always have for yourself? Like, is, did you want to be like a big name in the in the fantasy sports DFS content space? Um, and and he, he calls it the DFS content space again. Like, I'm like, well, you're both DFS. But like you do like best ball, I would say even bigger. Like you're a bigger proportion of the best ball content industry than DFS uh, in general. But in general, is this kind of like the direction that you wanted to be headed? No, I, I think I honestly would have been surprised if you would have showed me this when I started, partly because I came into it way more from the comedy side. Right. And I think I learned early on, it absolutely scratched the creative itch, but it was just much harder to grow and find a wider audience when you're doing like niche within a niche within a niche. And then, you know, because I loved playing fantasy sports so much, it kind of ended up being like, you know, I'm not trying to frame myself as an expert, but I don't mind like documenting my play. And that's even how ship chasing started. Um, me and Pat Crane, you know, starting with a podcast, that was actually a written uh, article on Rotovid, just like documenting our first time playing in the FFPC main event. And so I think that ended up kind of supplementing kind of the other creative comedic side. And now I would say it's tilted more toward obviously the documenting. I do a lot more like strategy type stuff for fantasy yeah. life. Obviously on XM, it's more traditional fantasy advice. So I think that would have surprised me if you told me how much actual analysis I'm doing. And part of that is dovetailed with just falling in love with like the game theory aspects, specifically on underdog where it's still more fertile yeah. ground for new ideas and experimentation. And I, you know, parts of me do wish like, if I could have the living I do now exclusively doing comedy, I probably would take that deal. Um, but like, it's also not feasible. And I, you know, when I make like the best ball bros video or when I get a chance to do something comedic, like I do, that's when like, I really get jazzed up and a lot of things I get excited and have fun doing. But I think that would surprise me that I, the ratio of like non-comedy stuff I'm doing now. So, so you wish that it was a bigger proportion comedy relative to like, true analysis yeah like if you know if sites wanted to you know pay me to just like make one comedy video a week where i just like go in the lab and i script and i'm working on characters and i'm getting set pieces or whatever <laughs> but it's just like that is it's it's hard to make that sustainable yeah. um and that was you know i think it's i have zero regrets but that you know people always talk about like when your hobby becomes a job like you know that ended up being like something where the when i was only doing this for a hobby, it was much easier to just be like, hey, I'm not getting paid or I'm getting paid very little. I'm just going to make comedy videos to where now I have to think about it more from like a livelihood perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. So I, I feel like your like background as a comedian or I guess just being a funny guy in general is like part of the reason that you are so successful, even in the more serious analysis. It's people like, you know, like, you know we, we check in for ship chasing. Sure, like you, you all are sharp guys. You give good analysis, but also it's like, you guys have fun together. Like it's clear that you're you're having fun, and also like you're you're a funny guy. It's a, it's a funny crew. So it's uh, I feel like you know you even though it's not like planned comedy comedy necessarily. Like you're not like doing sketches or anything like that. Like I feel like yeah. you're, you're still like getting to express your com comedy to some extent. W would you agree with that, or is it just like you want to be more like uh, strategic in your comedic uh, comedic output? 
No, I mean, and I, I probably I probably mischaracterize a little bit because so much of what is still fun for me and I do, and when I you know work with Lou to get clips from my shows, like I think of you know my best ball breakfast stream this morning. Yes, I'm drafting a team. I'm talking a little bit about the combine news, but like I'm doing bits. Like bits are what are fun to me, and so yeah, I'm always leaning into it, scratching that itch. Like I know what is fun for me. I know what is, um, you know what what is something I because people can get they can get really good information in a ton of spots yep. these days. They can get live streams in a ton of spots. So I, it's a, it works in a, in a nice way where it's like one, I can do what I really enjoy. And also I can do, do the things that other people aren't doing and, and then it, have fun with that. So yeah, no, I, I think it's more just saying I'm surprised that how much of the content I do is turned into like, if you would have told me I had a podcast like with Brian that, you know, started out as like a DFS strategy adjacent show. And now we talk like industry gossip, like even that would have surprised me, but <laughs> I, it, it does go back to, I think what you're saying though, where a lot of it is um, like uh like relationship driven and like, yeah. Oh, you know, I become friends with Brian and I like doing that show with him and our rapport, the ship chasing guys, like getting to know Ben and Gretch. Like we have such a good vibes to where a lot of my content now is just hanging out with my friends right. online um, which can be self-indulgent, but it's like makes it sustainable. Like it's just, oh yeah, I'm catching up. Like we haven't done ship chasing for two weeks. I'm excited to hear what like Pat and Gretch have been up to. And a as a regular audience member, I got to say like, that's enjoyable. Like I, I enjoy checking in, you know, feels like you're, you're part of the crew. Like, and that's, it's kind of like how it is with, I'd say shows across the industry. People like, you know, the, the community aspect is like, there, there is something to the, the whole, like being part of the community, you get to know the people that are on the show. So it is, uh, it's enjoyable that you guys do seem to actually like each other, like hanging out and, uh, you get to, we get to feel kind of included in, in those hangouts. Um, I want to talk about Lowell's a little bit because um, that's, yeah. you know, I that, that, I don't remember if that was like my first exposure to your stuff. I think that I knew you knew who you were before Lowell's, but that, that started like, like being when I started watching your content regularly because like, Lowell's was like has been can't miss for me for at least a, a few years now. Um, how how so how did that come about? How did you and, and Brian get connected and it's funny you, you said that it started as, as a like dfs analysis show i never really saw it that way that was uh you know when i started watching lols it was kind of like uh pete's the funny guy brian's like the dfs pro like they just have i don't know just kind of a, a an interesting dynamic fun back and forth um and then of course the, the more that i've gotten to watch lols i've kind of found like well you're also very sharp and i the part, part of what makes it work is you are also very sharp Ryan is also very funny. So I feel like it's a good dynamic in that sense that like you both like have your roles, but like you're both actually very good at the other person's role also. Uh, so I, I've loved Lowell's for many years now. How did that come about? Um, has it, how has it changed from what it was initially supposed to be? Yeah. And I guess I should say not like w when we initially conceived it, I think one of the, you know, one of the hooks was going to be, Hey, Brian is a DFS pro hadn't yeah. really done a ton of content. He had made, made some of those videos on his YouTube channel. And it was going to be like the, I thought the dynamic early on was going to be how much alpha can I pull out of Brian right. for, for the DFS crap? Like that's kind of what I thought it was going to be. And obviously the show has morphed into something entirely differently. And I think that's, what's kind of cool about it is that the show has now become like a melding uh, where we both like met in the middle, you know, it's not just like Brian's DFS bro. I'm comedy guy. And we're just doing our own thing. Yeah. It's like that show has just become, you know, a, an intersection of our interests and stuff. But yeah, that was interesting. It was right. So right before COVID hit, um, Brian reached out to me and he was like, Hey, um, I enjoy your stuff. I'm like, you know, kind of interested in doing more content, like starting a podcast. I thought you would be like the perfect host for it. Um, would you be interested in doing that? And like, I knew Brian's name from, you know, just DFS leaderboards and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, that that's cool. But I was also like, um, I was literally just about to go on a two week trip uh, to Japan with my wife. It was like my dream vacation. And, you know, I was doing some other stuff and I was kind of like enjoying, I don't know, not having a lot going on. And I kind of was like, you know, I, I think I just have too much going on right now. I think I'm going to pass. Um, and then literally like a week or two later, our trip got canceled because of COVID. Japan was like one of the ground zeros. And, you know, we all get thrown into lockdown. And I like came back kind of like tail between my legs to Brian. I was like, fuck it, dude, let's do it. Like, what, what else am I going <laughs> to yeah, do? Like, more time. I'm not going into the office. Um, I wanted to start doing more content, more live streaming. And so we just went for it. And, 
you know, even early on, this was pre, I mean, StreamYard existed at the time. I think I hadn't quite found it. And I was kind of, that was actually, I think my hesitation. I was like, dude, I actually am not good at like this production stuff. I've tried some OBS and it like crashed my computer. And I had like anxiety being like, this is gonna be a lot of work. And he's like, don't worry, I'll get a producer or whatever. And so some of our early episodes were produced by this other guy. He was a nice guy yeah. on OBS. And then eventually I said, Brian, I'm like, dude, I'm ripping all my streams on StreamYard. It's really easy. Yeah. I'll just do it. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it started. Um, obviously the League of Legends stuff at the beginning, we had the whole bit about removing toxicity in the space because one of the dynamics that was playing out, and I think I've mentioned this on shows before, is like all the hardcore League of Legends guys were like getting really pissed at the DFS players. They're like, they're coming in with their optimizers and ruining the game. And it's like, cause they used to win with their hand building and their yeah. player takes that were just coming in and ripping it optimizer lineups. But yeah, that's uh, I guess that's the, the, the origin story of lulls there. Yeah. That's uh that's really fun. So you, uh, what, what do you remember when your trip was planned? Were you also a, a March uh, trip guy, March 2020. Did you have? I had. I, I was uh, about to be going to the Philippines with my my buddy here um, is is Filipino, and his cousin was getting married, and like his parents were gonna like pay for our hotel. So we we had this awesome trip planned to the Philippines, and literally a week before we were about to leave, uh, the Rudy Gobert uh, ended ended the world yep. incident happened, and we had we to were live on moles when that happened. <laughs> Did, did, yeah. were, at that point, had you already, were you smarter than us and you had already canceled your trip by that point? Because I was very much like, I feel like we should be canceling this trip at, at that point. Um, and then finally that, that incident was like, okay, we need to cancel this trip. Yeah. I think it, it was the fact that, um, what was it? The like carnival princess ship, um, outside of Japan was like one of the ground zero stuff. And that made it, I think more real. I think I would have been more stubborn otherwise of like, God damn it, I'm going on this trip. But then I started to get really worried about getting marooned over there, um, yeah. which if they hey. got shut down and we had already started to hear, like we were going to go to like a sumo match. We were going to go to a baseball game. And we heard that a lot of their public events had already been canceled. And so then I'm already starting to weigh, like if we, even if we get on that plane, are we going to be able to do the things we were excited to do. Um, luckily I got out in front of it. I think it was like late February or early March. I, it, and I was very fortunate because I got the airline to refund our ticket. And then all the places I went around to, I got like 98% of all my deposits and bookings back. Yeah. Cause I kept showing them. I was like, we did too. The, I, I got the, like the doctor's note and all that being like, <laughs> Hey, the Japan airlines canceled our thing, please. They say it's not safe for us to travel. Um, but I'm still heartbroken because that was like, Lauren and I knew, that then we wanted to start thinking about having kids. Right. And in my mind, I was like, this is my last big trip. Right. It's the trip I've always wanted to go on. And uh, it fell through my fingers, but I built a content career uh, instead. So I guess uh, you yeah. win some, you lose some. Yeah. So, so you have not been to Japan? Nope. So maybe nope. maybe sometime in the future, still that dream trip will come. But uh, <laughs> with, with at least one kid at, at this point, I guess. Yeah. I had said to uh, Lauren actually on a walk yesterday, I was like, <laughs> I was like, it was me doing mental gymnastics. I was like, you know, April's really smart. I'm like, if maybe if she's like a really mature, like six or seven year old, we could justify taking her to Japan. I'm like trying to think like, at what age could I realistically take a small child to Japan and have it still be enjoyable? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, I don't have kids. So I don't have to worry about that, thankfully. Um, now, now that we've talked a little bit about like how you got to know Brian and like how you describe what Lowell's is supposed to be, I kind of want to have that same brief conversation about like all the other shows that you are on, like Ship Chasing. So you're on Ship Chasing with, uh, you, you said just you and Pat Corain started. Now I know Gretch is, I think, a regular there as yeah. well on, on Ship Chasing. So how, how did Ship Chasing come to be? What was the plan for Ship Chasing? Have you, have you stuck to the plan? Uh, yeah, I mean, Ship Chasing, I, I would say it's evolved yet it's very close to the core mission, which is just documenting us playing high stakes. And like, yeah, we give a lot of advice and thoughts and takes, but it's always like embedded into being players. And I mean, you can even go to the content. Like I, I try, you know, I like variety. So, you know, I was already drafting a ton of teams last year and, you know, we'd be like, all right, let's just, let's talk strategy. Let's talk some ADP movements or whatever on the show. And everyone would be like draft, 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 draft. And it's like, I partly I'm like, come on guys, can we take one week off? On the other <laughs> hand, it's like people subscribe to that show because they yeah. like watching us draft. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, Pat and I met doing fantasy land, which was, um, an NPR style road podcast that fantasy douche and Matthew Friedman 
asked me to host. Um, and then Pat was going to help do some of the audio and the tech stuff and then came on and ended up being like a bigger part of it because he was such a workhorse and so good with all of that stuff. And these were like heavily scripted audio episodes. I think like, you know, things really culminated when we made the, I, I essentially call it an audio documentary about Chris Wessling. It was about an hour and 45 minute um, podcast. And obviously, you know, Chris ended up passing away a few years with his second bout with cancer, but we like documented it, talked to everyone in his life and like told like a story that I'm probably one of the things I'm still most proud of from yeah. creating content. And, you know, we then ran into an issue where it's just like the man hours, the time, the production cost for these episodes relative to the audience we're getting it just, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. Um, but one of the last episodes we had made was uh, me and Pat going to Vegas, documenting kind of radio style, our first time playing in the uh, the main event, getting our thoughts, but also interviewing other high stakes players, et cetera. And then we were like, why don't we just keep this going? You know, let's morph it more into, we will document us playing on this site. So the next year, I think the podcast ended up being called High Stakes Diaries, which I hate that name so much. <laughs> um, fortunately, we ended up uh, shifting it to ship chasing. Uh, and yeah, and so ever since then, like Pat and I have just been playing high stakes, documenting it brought Gretchen to the fold uh, a few years back and then obviously started as season long managed stuff primarily. And then, you know, best ball has become such a big part of it now as well. You, you talked about your road of his time. I think, I think it might've been your best ball after dark with Corrine. I, I watched that one recently. I think it was probably there that you were talking about it. Um, and I, I definitely like listening to that. I was like, man, I really want to go back and find this content. And I think you talked about uh, potentially making it easier to find somehow on that podcast. I don't know if you have, I haven't gone back and found it, but that sounds super interesting. Uh, it sounded like you did an episode yeah. on Matthew Barry also that you, you were uh, going to try to sell him on. Was it, was that also the fantasy land? Yeah, that one, I don't believe actually was a published episode. It was okay. kind of in another kind of full circle moment, but one of our last hail Marys was like, can we present what we're doing, um, you know, to Matthew and basically be like, you know, he already had his brand of fantasy life kind of stories adjacent to yeah. the world of fantasy. And we made an episode about him as part of like a pitch deck, essentially yeah. being like, would you fund this podcast? Could we kind of keep it going? Didn't end up pan out, but as things come full circle, you know, I now work uh, with Matthew over on fantasy life and all of that. So in the long run, it worked out, but yeah, I think, Rotoviz re syndicated the Fantasyland um, podcast on their main feed about three years ago. Those links do still work. Um, someone actually asked me for the link the other day. I should just aggregate them in one spot, but they do yeah. exist. And I real they, you know, we did an episode on Zero RB, you know, at the time, which is we talked to Sean Siegel, and it's funny to go listen back because it's like everything holds up. Like all the principles, wow. all the macro stuff is the same. And yet people still can't wrap their head around it. No. Why would you do zero RB? You need running backs. You got to play a running back, Pete. What are you doing? Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that uh, that's funny. So you, you brought him up actually just a, a minute ago. Uh, the uh, the fantasy douche. You, you mentioned him on the show. Yeah. Every time I hear the name fantasy, douche, I am not familiar with the fan du fantasy douche at all. Every time I hear it, like everybody says he's super sharp, like really nice guy. I picture, I think the counselor. The other guy that, that uh, you you sometimes do bits about the counselor. That's every time I hear the fantasy douche, I picture that guy. And I think that's who we're talking about. And I from oh no, this is a completely different guy. This is like like somebody that everybody seems to really really respect. Is he is he still involved in fantasy sports? No, um, okay. he is under uh, a different alias now, making a podcast. I he is. I don't know if anyone has ever publicly kind of made the connection. His podcast is having a lot of success. It's really well made, but I. Uh, I don't feel like being the one to fully dox, dox him, him. Okay. right now, but very successful guy founded Rotoviz, and it, it is insane. Like thinking about the tree, you know, we joke about kitchens tree. I mean, the fantasy douche tree, you know, obviously Sean Siegel who went on to buy the site. Um, you know, so many guys, Herms Meyer, Kevin Cole, like I could sit here. I mean, Denny was writing there, Rich Rebar, Bales, like you could just list so many people got their start contributing um, to Rotoviz, and he was, he was just one of those kind of like effortlessly brilliant kind of guys. And you know, a lot of people, when they write, they kind of, it's like, I want you to know I'm smart or I'm going to yeah, do yeah. these things. Like he was probably one of the more like breezy writers, always wrote the shortest post, distilled it down to the most crucial information. And then we learned so much from him. Not that he even had a background in audio production, but he would take a look at our scripts for Fantasyland 
And, you know, Pat and I would like sculpt these things and be like, all right, we're ready to do it. And he would kind of come in and just like a wizard and like move this around and move this around. And I'd like want to be mad and be like, you're fucking up with my foot. And then I'm like, no, nope, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. So he was just a guy I learned a lot from how he communicated, how he carried himself, how he wrote, how he thought about business. And um, yeah, he's just a really talented dude that I know a lot of people really enjoyed learning from. Yeah, you, you talked about that with Pat, and I think uh, Pat gave the anecdote that like you would send him an hour long podcast, and forty five minutes later he would come, he would immediately turn around forty five minutes later with like great constructive criticism. Uh, so clearly, listen to it on on two x speed, and then really quick <laughs> yeah. with his with his analysis. Uh, sounds like a really impressive guy. I'm sad that I uh, missed out on the fantasy douche. I, I've consumed a lot of fantasy sports content in my day, but uh, there's a lot of it out there too. So you don't always find all the best stuff. So. Maybe, maybe he'll come back one day. Maybe, um, yeah. Like I said, he, he's back. Maybe if once he uh, is willing to uh, to make the connection. He does have a really cool podcast that's like adjacent to the fantasy space. So uh, maybe yeah. it'll see the light of day sometime. Um, so moving on. So uh, we talked about ship chasing a little bit. Swolecast. You do the Swolecast with Davis Maddock, David Kitchen, and uh, Tuttle, Dan Gasper. Uh, what was the, what's the purpose of the Swolecast? Has it stuck to its original purpose? And, and how did it come together in the first place? <laughs> well, that's, now, that's a funny question. What is the purpose of the Swolecast? Many are asking. <laughs> People who write checks at Better Collective are probably asking that same question, Neil. Um, no, I mean, that was honestly another one of like, one of the more like exciting moments for me because I was a diehard fan of the Swolecast. Like I... I would genuinely look forward to watching that show each week in the same way you look forward to watching like Game of Thrones. Like yeah. I was the guy that would put that up and cast it on my television. Like it would be like my wife would go to bed on a Saturday night and I would be like, all right, I'm going to have crack a few beers and watch the Swole cast because Evan and all, all of those guys and Davis like cracked me up so much. Like I, I legit loved every second of it. I ended up making the Swole cast parody video as man's as like an homage to how much I loved that show. Wait, wait, can, and I don't want to interrupt you, but uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I was not, I've, I've never watched the Swole cast until recently to be honest. So I don't know. Yeah. You say Davis and Evan, who, who, who was the original crew? I didn't realize that it existed before you were on it. It's the exact crew, except it was Evan Silva instead of me. Okay. Oh, funny. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so then when Evan Silva left to do ETR, you know, he kind of consolidated all of his, because when Evan was at Roto World, he would like, he would do regular hits like everywhere. Like he had regular podcast stuff. Like he was on everyone's podcast, including a regular spot on the Swole cast. <laughs> I think, I think the guys at ETR were like, we're reeling you in, man. Like yeah. we got to get your voice over here at ETR, get people to come over here. Yeah. Um, and so Kitchen had the brilliant idea of replacing Silva with me. Um, I say that half jokingly. I actually think he was really smart in that. Don't try to replace Evan Silva. Just try to make right. the show almost something else. Yeah. Um, which is exactly what happened. Um, so yeah, I, and so when kitchen asked me, I, I thought he was like bullshitting me, uh, to be on the show. And I remember being like pretty nervous. Cause I'm like, first of all, everyone's gonna be like, where the fuck is Evan Silva? Um, I was far, far less confident as a fantasy analyst than I am now. Um, and so that was like an interesting thing, but I think I found my lane early on and now it is, it is a comedy podcast where we happen to yeah. talk about, uh, fantasy football or DFS and sometimes I fucking sometimes love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's really, I, I really have gotten more into it this year. I feel like I've like slowly, slowly you're taking over my content world where I'm just consuming Pete Overs at content constantly. And, and that's a, a newer one for me is watching the swell cast. So I got to say, I think it's the, the funniest intro out there i know i, I love the lulz intro but i just love that just like yeah i haven't done any research but just like over and over I haven't done any <laughs> research just pretty pretty hilarious I, i'm a big fan of uh the intro for the swole casting yeah it's a really really entertaining show really good dynamic again just like a casual hanging out with your friends sometimes you get into talking about dfs or i mean you, you always get into it. I'm, I'm joking you, you get into it at some point but uh sometimes it takes longer than others and, and i don't think anybody complains that it sometimes takes a little while to get into the fantasy sports no stuff. people complain yeah in the comments but <laughs> I suppose. the people who get the people who show up live know what they're getting into but the people who like stumble upon it because it is like one of the first look uh shows yeah, yeah. So i think you get people who are like just scouring for like who's talking about this slate and then they stumble <laughs> upon us and i don't think they ever come back it's always funny to me that people really want to know who the plays are on monday or tuesday when it's like yeah it's all gonna change like it doesn't matter what we say right now it's all gonna change by the time the weekend comes along but yeah there are people who just really i think it's, it's probably season-long people who want to know like does my team look good next week am i gonna win next week i don't know i'm 
speculating who who could want that content that early other than for the entertainment aspect um you do often on the clock with the badge bros is that just one day a week yeah we did it on on fridays this is the first year we did it in season which it made sense for you know trying to get as much information as possible uh to talk about the slate and now off season we moved it to wednesdays um just because i wanted to free up my fridays Nice. And it's uh so you, you do daily drafts generally and, and I know you do some pick 'em too. It's like generally a mix of daily drafts and pick 'em. Do you do any best ball on that show? Um, I'm sure we will in the off season. Like we drafted a, a dinger baseball team and uh, I'm sure we'll do mess around and, and do some dar- various sports. But yeah, in season, very much a, a football show. Um, those guys obviously cover things uh, closely, but that was always kind of like our our final thoughts. You know, I I wrote up a piece for Fantasy Life this year. My favorite kind of like scroll down hidden gems pieces. They obviously did content, and then we kind of came together and gave our final kind of strategy thoughts before the slate as people head into the weekend of drafting. So yeah, that was the first year doing that. You know, in partnership with underdog and uh yeah have a blast doing content with those guys got to meet them all in uh, miami for the dog bowl and yeah love love doing shows with the badge bros yeah i want to keep talking about the badge bros but i also want to say uh, if you guys do have questions for pete we have a hard out in a little bit under half an hour now uh so we don't have that much longer to talk uh so if you have questions uh, let us know but i i do i still have more questions i want to follow up with because I wasn't familiar with the Badge Bros until I think you kind of introduced me to the Badge Bros. So I, I kind of considered them to be part of your tree. And of course, they are in the Deposit Kingdom. Like they have their own channel in the Deposit Kingdom. So I think it's a fair assessment to call the Badge Bros a part of the Pete Overzet tree. And I got to say, like, they're really sharp, really entertaining. Like I've, I've become a big fan of the Badge Bros myself. So I, I think that's a good find on your part. How did you, you know, come together with the Badge Bros? And I know at this point, like they are, you, you both have, partnerships with underdogs so that's part of it but how, how did you first get introduced to the badge bros and how did that partnership kind of come to be yeah i think it i mean I, man i don't know if uh, maybe nez or john or Numi can remember the exact origin story i'm actually like blurry on it right now i know i was so i had gotten acquainted with john way back when he was working oh. on this other site uh fantasy football world series which was essentially trying to like mash up these different fantasy formats and so we had worked with him on ship chasing we had a year and where we all competed doing that so i knew john and knew of his you know poker background and that he was very into like the game theory side of things and i had knew no nez too from the ship chasing community um he had done a draft with us a couple years ago so i were i knew they were smart guys and i remember i legit remember being like jealous of them last year because they were going so hard at underdog dailies and yeah. i'm like you know banging my head against the wall trying to win on DraftKings. but i had like i'm stubborn and i had like committed like this is the show this is like the content i'm doing um and i was like i i'm going to rectify this this offseason i'm going to add more underdog programming i'm going to make tweaks and i wanted to do it in conjunction with the badge bros because they had already kind of made that dedication and i think they you know i'd reached out to them and kind of pitched them on kind of making their home in the deposit kingdom because it was such a natural fit where yeah. i wasn't covering all of those sports but it was just so firmly within the venn diagram of what people like to do in the deposit kingdom so um they are now such a huge part of the deposit kingdom and their channels are some of the most active in the discord and yeah i feel like they just I, I vibe with them on that wavelength la- wavelength so easily that it felt yeah. like a natural uh fit and then yeah when we were kind of brainstorming and i was talking with underdog and stuff about content they're like well you know what if you guys do kind of a show together talk strategy battle royale stuff and i was like done sold so yeah that's kind of uh how it started with those guys yeah and they as, as far as i know and this is probably not true but uh, i think that they're like the only people regularly doing uh content for the underdog dailies i don't know if that's true maybe there's more out there that i'm not as familiar with but like they are the one that i'm really familiar with doing just like underdog daily dress we're going to stream it we're going to do it together and i think it was a really great idea on their part to to start doing that Uh, i really enjoy it watching their underdog daily content and of course i I think i mean i don't take it for granted because like i i mean it is legitimately impressive and i know there's a lot of people who uh, draft multiple sports and are very good at it. But I, I really think people take for granted or underestimate to not only be making content about all of those things, but also be playing at a, at a high level in the way those guys do getting a ton of volume down 
talking, sharing their ideas. Like it is a lot. It is a lot to be doing it across as many sports as they do. Um, they're, they're grinders. They're great dudes. So yeah, they are, they're very impressive, uh, to me and what they're able to do. Absolutely. Um, yeah, just the, uh, the, the 30 second time clock to get your pick in. Sometimes <laughs> I found when I, when I do drafts with other people on a stream, it like, it's hard to like, people want to tell you their whole thought, their whole reasoning. And it's like, it takes 45 seconds. We only have 30 seconds. I gotta, I gotta click a button here. Have you found yeah. uh, issues with that when you, when you live stream with other people? Um, I feel like I have so many under my belt that I kind of, you know, I, I, I often do the, I think the ship chasing my move is like, uh, let's make this pick and then we can talk about it. You know, like yeah, right. you kind of. I even watch it, you know, like based on where my draft slot is, I think I have this mental calculus, even this morning I was doing it where I was like, oh, I kind of want to go on this tangent. And I'm like, I need to wait until I'm on the long side of the board and then yep. I can launch yep. it. And then I kind of like, exactly. bam, get that pick under my belt and like, okay, now this is what I wanted to say. Um, so when you just stream a ton, you start to feel those spots and you know what needs to be done. But I, I still time out like once a, once a stream, uh, cause you start talking, you get distracted and next thing you know, you know, you're selecting Dylan Loeb uh, on accident. I think you, you have probably spent the most time of anybody on planet earth streaming drafts. Would you agree with that? Cause you, <laughs> did, you streamed all 150 of your uh, big, your uh, best ball mania drafts last year. Yeah, probably. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to get surpassed sometime in the next year or two years as someone else is hungry or takes on a more uh, maniacal challenge, like streaming every day or something. Uh, well, Spags like is that. doing that right now, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there was a, there was a guy last year. I don't know if he uh, he submitted to the fantasy football um, datable, and he was streaming every single day. I don't know if he kept that up. Um, but yeah, no, there, there'll be some young guns who are coming for my best ball hourly, uh, crown. There might be some old guns too. Just, just warning you. There might be some old guns. Uh -oh, uh -oh. This year. I, I haven't decided. I, I, I've thought about, am I going to try to stream all 150 of my big boards? Um, you know, I'll, I'll uh, your big it. boards. Sorry. I, I, no, I'm already halfway through my big boards. All right. best I, ball would yeah, yeah. I would start praying for you right now. If yeah, your no. goal is to stream all 150 big boards. <laughs> I'll get like 10, 10 people watching them. No, <laughs> people aren't ready to watch best ball as much. I guess you're, yeah. you're getting good uh, viewership on your best ball streams. I know the, the more, the people who have been doing it longer uh, have a little bit of an audience who will watch best ball, even real sickos watching best ball streams in March. Um, I'm not ready to do them every day just yet, but maybe, maybe my best ball mania. I'll think about doing it. Um, we do have some questions. I, I want to uh, finish off talking about. Do we do we have any other shows? Uh, I know last year you were you did a lot of uh, collaboration with Spags on Splash Play. Is that still? Are you guys going to be doing drafts together this year? I haven't I haven't touched base with Spags okay. recently. Um, yeah, it was definitely unfortunate. Uh, we because we had the show under the um, uh, foot. Uh, what was it now? Football Outsiders umbrella. Oh um, right. Okay. Yeah, and that was that was unfortunate. And like the other thing too is like I'm constantly. Um, and I mentioned this last year too. I'm like, whenever I add stuff, uh, I'm, I used to just say yes to everything, which goes yeah. back to kind of my improv mindset where you just say yes to everything and you figure yeah. it out. Then I had a kid and I realized I am going to drown if I just say yes to everything. And so when I add new stuff, I needed to like pull back in certain ways. And even this year, like I will be doing less best ball mania live streams because I'm going to be really focused on making more pre-recorded videos on the deposit kingdom YouTube channel. And that's like one of my goals. And instead of just be like, I'm going to stream 150 and grow this channel, I'm having to be realistic. So that's a long way of saying like, yeah, splash play was one of the things I haven't been able to do regularly. Definitely need to get back into a, a collab with, with Spags soon. But yeah, that was uh, always enjoyed getting to do regular shows with Spags. It's just not a uh, part of the calculus right now. Yeah. That's tough. Um, what was I going to say? I forget. I forget what I, I had. I had a response there to something you said. Oh, yeah. Uh, f uh, final thing that you uh, actually I, you probably have other things, places that you are uh, have your hand in the pot, whatever. Uh, but Matthew Berry Fantasy Life newsletter, another piece. Yeah. Of How did it come to be that you are writing the newsletter for uh, Matthew Berry Fantasy Life? Yeah, it was again. Yeah. So March 2020 was the COVID stuff. It was that like August. Um, Matthew just reached out to me. Um, he had like started following me on Twitter a little bit before. Um, and like, we had kind of like loosely known each other via some of that fantasy land stuff where we were in talks. Um, but yeah, he basically was like, Hey, I have this big email list because I have kind of my merchandise site and my book. He had basically amassed, you know, a ton of emails during that time. And he's like, right now we just use it for promo blasts. It's like, Hey, there's a father's day sale. Do you want to buy some fantasy life merch? And he's like, I think I want to turn this into more of a content arm and I'd really like to build this up. Would you like to write a daily newsletter for me? Um, 
and it was a really interesting time to catch me because I do, I had done a ton of writing at my old job. I'd done like copywriting, marketing, right? Marketing. And so then when my free time, I was like, I want to do podcasts. I want to do videos. I write all day during the day, but I had already been kind of thinking of transitioning out of that, you know, doing content. I was like, you know, I'm not doing anything written within the fantasy space. This was going to be something I could kind of do in the morning. My shows were at night. Um, and I was like, sure, fuck it. This is Matthew Barry. Uh, he asked you to write a newsletter. Let's do it. And so, yeah, for essentially two years, I would basically write the daily newsletter in a Word doc, send it over to his marketing team who ran the site, and they would kind of format it and send it off. And then two years ago, he said, all right, we're going to turn this into a real company. Uh, we're going to hire a CEO, brought on Elliot Chris. We're going to hire an entire you know, team. And since then, it's morphed into a legit company, You know, dozens of, of full-time employees, content creators. Everyone knows Dwayne McFarlane, Ian Harditz, Matthew Friedman now has a betting life newsletter. So it's like turned into this actual fantasy site company, even lot, we just had a call today. I was telling you, that's why I had to move it and some like really exciting stuff coming down the pipeline for that. So yeah, uh, I was in the right place at the right time. And, you know, I don't write the newsletter seven days a week. Now I'm doing, I did it like four times a week in season, but yeah, I still, I love writing that newsletter. It keeps me up to date on, on the news. And it's just been a really good opportunity um, to get to kind of grow with Matthew and that site. So I have to admit, I only have, I, I don't even think I subscribe to it, which is it a free newsletter? I, I should subscribe it to is. it. It uh, is. Yeah. My issue. So I, I was an English major, Pete, and I don't read anything these days. So it's, <laughs> I read it only when like people like when, when somebody like tweets out your newsletter, then I'll like click it and read it. And it's, it's always really well done. It's actually sort of reminds me of Matthew Berry, like his writing back when he wrote for ESPN, he would do like preambles to his fantasy stuff and it's like you get into personal life stuff and it's always really i really enjoy it whenever i do read it i just never read anything these days so i need to if i subscribe to it there's there's a better chance that i will click on it so how, how do we subscribe yeah i mean the fantasy life newsletter you can get at fantasylife.com uh, there's also the betting life newsletter that matthew friedman uh runs if that's more your speed and yeah i think i you know, once I started doing the newsletter, I was kind of like you. I, I didn't read a lot of newsletters. I read them now, both because I've learned to enjoy them. At the time, it was just like, I kind of want to do research, kind of want to see how. Sure, yeah. And I learned a lot about kind of my own behaviors with newsletter. What what makes me click and open one of these? What makes me want to scroll to the very end versus yeah. getting bored and click off? And so that's certainly like informed my writing style. I think over the years where I legitimately try to write in a way that people like you who aren't necessarily have a routine of being willing to read these, that I'm going to make it breezy. I'm going to make it easy. I'm going to have lots of embeds and photos, yeah. lots of bullets, lots of single sentences, because the truth is, and I know how I do it. I skim a lot of newsletters. And so I kind of try to write in that way where it's like, I'm going to only ask for a few minutes of your time, but I'm going to make it enjoyable and I'm not going to make it feel like dense and like work. It's supposed to be something yeah. you quickly open up and get a good feel for things. And I, one of my, I, I really enjoy the athletic, uh, their general newsletter right now, because they do a really good, just quick roundup of like all sports stories. They'll talk about some women's basketball, something F1. I'm not even a fan of these things, but like knowing like the headlines and they just do a couple sentences. And so I think from a lot of good newsletters, I've kind of adopted how the fantasy newsletter i would want to read i'm i'm trying to get back into reading in general um you know like i i used to be a big reader and just like i guess just uh, the the internet has taken over my brain so i consume all of my content in video form but i'm trying to get back into reading in general so you know right now i just skim past every newsletter that's in my yeah inbox but I'm, I'm trying to to get better at that so uh, and, and like i said i have every time i have clicked it i've been like oh that was an enjoyable read i've always appreciated reading it it's just uh, i've never gotten in the habit of consuming content uh via reading these days um the consigliere asks a very important question he wants to know are you team rps or team ship it nation wow yeah no what no one has ever asked me i mean i think just by volume of you know ship it nation people the the run pure sports guys keep uh, turning down our invitation so until they come on and are willing to to tip the scales or really make me have a tough decision definitely team ship it uh dylan lob is he is he your guy this year um i have I've been on an emotional journey with Dylan Lobb. I, uh, he was at the top of Pat's leg up rankings that I was drafting off of last week when I did my first draft. I Googled him. I was very disappointed to see he was a scrawny uh, little white boy. And then um, I keep getting told 
that I'm wrong. He's here, you know, throwing up the, uh, the cross chop that. at the combine yeah. guys. I really respect Kevin Cole was just posting some of his prospect analysis, talking about how impressed he is and assuming the draft capitals there thinks he could catch a ton of balls as a rookie. So we went okay. from being scared to embracing it. And now we can barely leave a draft without adding Dylan to our squad. Uh, Tyler would want, wanted me to know, maybe one you to know is Dylan Lube. Apparently, I don't know if that's accurate or just he's trying to. It's just a fun. No, name. you just you just got baited to saying Lube on the YouTube airwaves. You gotta you gotta know how to uh, dodge uh, Tyler's landmines. I, I'm not supposed to say Lube on. Okay, well, I, I wish I knew. I guess I didn't realize that I I'm not supposed to say Lube on the airways. Uh. Um. Oh yeah, uh, the consigli. So uh, I, I've heard you reference that you are uh, in a book club. Uh, the consigliere <laughs> says, Neil, since you want to read more, ask Pete about any good books he might be reading. Uh, he said he promised it's a good transition. Are you reading any good books right now? Well, yeah, so I I, I always enjoy reading. I just, uh, in season, uh, you know, once the, like the, the rigmarole of the season gets going, I just, you know, you're draft, like, especially this year, I was like drafting all the time. You wake up or you're going to bed. And it was a few years back. I had a really good routine. This is obviously pre-kid yeah. um, where I would kind of wake up and I would basically just read for a couple hours in the morning and, you know, chewing through a lot of books, really enjoying it. And then you have a kid and like, you don't have that kind of time. And I would spend my times before bed um, just drafting teams or dicking around on my phone. And now that I've kind of like, settled in. I understand what my responsibilities are as a father. I kind of know my schedule better. I was like, I want to get back to reading more, but I also have kind of enjoyed doing a public accountability thing. So yeah. I said in my PO box newsletter, which is the the free personal newsletter I do each week that I wanted to read uh, 15 books before the season started, which was going to average out to about two a month. And I solicited a bunch of book recommendations from people who subscribe to the newsletter. And then each month I just kind of say, Hey, these are the two books I'm reading. You know, I still selfishly, you know, pick things that I think I'll enjoy reading. I'm not trying to make this sure. some, you know, you academic just read the, the exercise. Billy Walters book, I know. Yeah. You know, mixing in some stuff that's like adjacent to our interests, but then obviously like various fiction stuff, both books we're reading now have nothing to do uh, with the world of sports or anything, but it's been very fun where I feel like it's a cheat code. Like I'm getting the accountability. I've built up some good habits. I'm now reading before bed. Like I'm now grabbing my Kindle, like during the middle of the day when I have time to read for 20 minutes, cause I get hooked on a book. And instead of like dicking around on Twitter, I'm reading another ton of pages in my book. And then we got the channel in deposit kingdom. And it seems like a lot of people are tailing me uh, on reading those. And so, yeah, it's just been like a fun kind of change of pace for the off season. And uh, yeah, hopefully I can keep it rolling. And you say that this is a personal uh, newsletter. So you're doing the Matthew Berry Fantasy Life newsletter. You also have your own newsletter. Where, where can we find this one? Yeah, that's the P.O. Box newsletter. Uh, I actually, yeah, I just passed like, I think last week was my 53rd edition. So I've done it every Friday for the past year. Um, I initially had been wanting, I'm like, people say to me like, hey, Pete, you do so much stuff. It's all over the place. And I was like, oh, I'll do a newsletter. It's just kind of like a roundup of like, basically like links, like here was this, here was this. But that just kind of became a secondary thing. And I found that I really enjoyed writing the intro, which is just basically whatever I'm thinking about this week it might be health and fitness, might be about a book, might be about a topic in the fantasy space, like literally whatever's on my mind. Um, and so, yeah, it's just something I've really enjoyed now putting together. And uh, yeah, so if you want to kind of stay up to date about what I'm up to, things I'm interested in, uh, what I'm watching, what I'm listening to, you can subscribe to the PO Box newsletter. And you can, is that like, where, where do you find it? P.O. Box Newsletter. You have to, where do, I, where do I find it? Do I just search for it? Is there a URL? Is it on yeah, your can, Twitter somewhere? I can drop the uh, the link in the chat. Yeah, it's- uh, I, I, I'll I, throw I, it in the description on, on YouTube, at least. Um, yeah. I'll throw it in uh, oh, it says the comment has failed to post to Neil Orfield. Neil is keeping me shackled. Uh, I normally tweet <laughs> out the links to the web version of okay. the post. Uh, also, if you Google like P.O. Box Overzet, you'll, right. you'll get it. I'll find it. Yeah. And, uh, like I said, I've, I've consumed more and more uh, Overzet content over the years. You'll never regret consuming more Overzet content. So go go subscribe to that newsletter. Um, we, do, we don't have much time left, so I, I do want to give us time to, I want to give you time to answer uh, my question that I like to ask at the end okay. of these shows, which is, do you have a favorite win or win celebration in DFS, best ball, fantasy sports, whatever? Uh, do, you have a, do you have a favorite win or win celebration, like where you're out with friends when you won something? Yeah, I mean, the uh, it's not even, uh, you know, this this past year when I had those two top 10 finishes uh, in the Battle Royale the same week, that was very fun. I'll never forget the moment where, the, you know, the games are wrapping up right when I normally do bath time with April and uh, Lauren could, 
hear me like watching red zone, like on the phone while I'm doing the bath. And she's like, I know I normally like run the bath show. And it, and Lauren was like, go downstairs and sweat the games. Like <laughs> you got like, I got, I got this, that one's so always remember that moment. Um, that was very fun just because I had started to put so much time into getting better at the dailies. And, you know, these were massive contests, you know, I think there were like 56,000 entries that week. And so to have two top 10, two top seven finishes, like that was like a validation of all the time yeah. and effort I had spent getting better at those. Um, so that was fun. And even though it wasn't like my win, like the, when Pat won best ball mania, just having done content with him so much, um, that felt like very special. It was also like fraught with mixed emotions because of yeah. the DeMar Hamlin stuff and we had to abort a stream and, you know, all of that stuff. But that felt, again, like a validation of, you know, people used to like rat, like lots of people in the high stakes community, other content creators, like, oh, these guys are jokes, you know, with their zero RB and their all of this stuff. They're not real. They're non-serious. And I think that was kind of like a culmination, too, of like, no, not not only are are we more entertaining, we're actually winning the biggest right. tournaments out there too. So uh, Pat taking that down was like truly like one of the more special wins, even for me, uh, not being a part of that specifically. Yeah, that was that was a super cool win. And it was it's unfortunate like that the way it ended, like so anticlimactic with with the game being canceled. So it was like you didn't know for like another week that he actually won. It was I I watched your stream. Like that was a really enjoyable stream that you guys were doing sweating that out uh, and it was unfortunately you didn't actually get a resolution on the stream like we would have been so cool to be able to get that resolution of pat winning while you are live on the ship chasing stream but uh yeah no no such luck in that sense um all right uh we did get uh tyler tyler did ask uh, do you have any health goals for this year bf or health goals um yeah well i think what's interesting is i've I think it was, I don't know, it was like five or six years ago when I started doing intermittent fasting. And that's when I actually started thinking about, it was like the first time my metabolism had caught up with me. And I was like, all right, I should probably be more intentional uh, with stuff. I can't just do whatever I want. Um, and that was really an inflection point for me. And I think ever since then, I've had relatively good eating habits and relative consistency with working out. Um, one thing that's new for me this year is I, I feel like specifically too with having a kid. And I've written about this in my newsletter where I've been essentially in like a maintenance mode um, in cruise control where I'm really good at showing up. Like you're not gonna, you know, catch me like not getting in my exercise because it's so mental for me. Like just literally the, the act of sweating like puts me in a better setup for the rest of the day. So I've chased that, but I haven't really optimized around it. It's just like, okay. hey, I'm gonna get my exercise in. I'm really good at like not letting programming get in the way. It's like, oh, I'll go for a run. I'll, I'll do a hit workout. I'll do a bunch of pull-ups. I'll do a bunch of, you know, whatever, just get something done. And this off season, I'm actually doing a strength training program, trying to work on progressive overload, actually re um, increasing my weight and stuff like that. So this is the first time I'm actually doing that. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to see kind of where it takes me. Um, you know, sometimes it's a little harder when you're doing at a home gym, you can't get a spot, you know, if you're trying to do yeah. certain reps to exhaustion or sets to failure and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, that's kind of my new thing of actually, um, trying to be more systematic with throwing weight around as opposed to just being generally active. Right. Sounds like you are like kind of gamifying it in the same way we're gamifying other things, gamifying, like really doing deep analysis into your health. That's uh good for you. Um, I do. I want to ask this one one more question before we end, because uh, I thought thought it was interesting. Tyler asked, "Would Pete quit most of your stream slash work, uh, besides maybe one week if you won BBM three? How, how do you think if, if you won Best Ball Mania? I guess it would be five this year. If you won Best Ball Mania this year, and assuming it's you know two plus million dollars, um, would you would you continue streaming? Would, would it change your career path? Do you think? I would probably do more streaming. Um, in that I think I would. I, I am very fortunate and I've, you know, who hasn't done the thought exercise of like, Hey, yeah. if you win BBM, how would that, that change your life? And I think I'm pretty fortunate in that it wouldn't change my life that much. I think what it would make me do is I would care less about optimizing content, you know, where a lot of times you're trying to think like, how can I get the most out of this? How can I grow? You know, how can I get more views and, and make sure that I am growing and not stagnating? I think it would just like take that burden. It's like, who cares? Sure. You know, like yeah. I don't, Do whatever you want. If, if I rest on my laurels from that perspective and I'm just making content, I really like making, which is what I do. But yeah. I think where the stress comes from is how can I optimize this? How can I repurpose this? How can I be a better marketer of this? So it's one of those things where it's like, I think I'd be continue doing like near identical 
what I'm doing now because again, like I work with people I like. I do shows with my friends. I, I love doing my solo live streams. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think that would change. I think I would just be like I'd be more of a bully with my schedule. I'd be like, all right, I'm gonna stream every day from ten to noon. I'm gonna work out from noon to two. I'm gonna like you know I'd yeah. just be like, fuck it, this is my schedule, and I'm not accommodating anyone. That's probably not what coming I'm on your doing. show, Neil. I'm not doing plain. <laughs> yeah, fuck off, Neil. Yeah. I gotta go make my fruit smoothie. <laughs> um, well, I, I said earlier in the stream, I, I said, you know, I, I never had Pete on high stakes in part because I took him for granted and, uh, and I didn't, uh, I didn't mean it. I, I said, I knew I could get Pete, but I didn't really mean like, like I knew I could get Pete. Well, uh, obviously a great you're, you're guest giving to have a little revisionist screen. history there because I remember you reaching out and I was like, why, I, why do you have, why do you want me on high stakes? You had had like a series of crushers on and I'm like, I'm the only one of these people that doesn't win at DFS at a high level. And I was like, why, why do you want me on the show? Well, you're a great guest. You're just an, an entertaining guy and obviously a very sharp guy. No, you, you would have been, a, the, the funny thing is, so I intentionally uh, got away from the high stakes name because there were several people who were like, I'm not a high stakes player. And I'm like, I never really wanted to be a stream for high yeah, stakes yeah. players. That was just the name we landed on. So uh, happy, happy to get away from that name for this stream. But you know, I'm, I feel, I feel very lucky uh, that you were willing to come on my show. I'm glad that you did not win Best Ball Mania last year. So I got my, my last crack to get you on no. the podcast. I, I actually think, uh, I, I mean, I'm clearly joking about that. If I yeah. won Best Ball Mania, I would be happy to, uh, you know, I, because there is like, the truth is there is a, an opportunity cost of at, of time. And I felt the time squeeze um, more, but part of me being efficient with my time is like, I want to be able to do things like this. Like, this is yeah. fun. Like, I would have told you I didn't want to do this if I didn't think it'd be fun. Yeah. And I, if I didn't like your stuff or like you're doing, like I've already devoured both of your shows with sacrilegious and shit my money. Um, so yeah, I felt, uh, honored and, uh, yeah. And with you kind of going out on your own, I know like, these are the kind of shows I like to consume. So the least I can do is point it in the direction of other people. Um, so they can find it and enjoy, uh, what you're working on here. Yeah, and, and I, I really appreciate it. You, you've always been very supportive of me for even before I had much of a following at all. You were uh, supportive of my work, and I've always appreciated that. Um, Pete, we we gotta we gotta close up. I know you got places to be. Where can people find you? <laughs> uh, yeah, too too many places. Uh, I would I would say like the the thing I'm enjoying right now the most is working on my um the the newsletter. So definitely get subscribed to Fantasy Life PO Box. Both completely free newsletters. Um, mine just drops in your inbox once a week on Friday mornings. Um, and it's also like, that is the best place to get the roundup of what I've done in the week. Like yeah. anything I've done, articles, uh, Neil will get a link on playing for keeps in the PO nice. box newsletter, all of that stuff. It's a good place to, um, uh, to stay up to date on all of that. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you very much to Pete for joining me for episode three of playing for keeps episode four. I haven't, haven't scheduled it, but it should be next Wednesday night, probably around 9 PM Eastern time. You should be able to find it live on YouTube, or if you are uh, wherever you get your podcast should be there probably the next morning. Thank you guys for hanging out with us for episode three, and I'll catch you next time.